Welcome to the Health on Track podcast. Let's talk well-being. Welcome to the Health on Track podcast, offering you a shot of wellness. I'm Yasmin, Member Engagement and Communications Manager at GIG Gulf Insurance. This episode is a very special one. Eight countries of the GIG group have been working together on a project that will transform the well-being of members. We have contracted YouGov to conduct research on the current state of well-being in the region and to share the findings in a comprehensive report, which you can find on our website. The link is available in the episode description. For this super special episode, it's only fitting that we also have super special guests who will share their expert insights and feedback. Joining us today is Paul Firth, founder and managing director of Lyra Wellbeing, a leading global provider of employee wellbeing programs. We're also here today with Inas Abushashia, co-founder and COO of Tekellum, an online platform for psychological counseling. Thank you so much for taking the time to be here, Paul Thank and you for Inas. Inviting me. Of course. Uh, so Paul, can you tell us more about uh, Lyra Wellbeing? Uh, Lyra Wellbeing, we're um, a corporate employee wellbeing program provider. We're a global provider. We operate in, uh, well, all the countries around the world. Um, we're a UK-based company, um, but ultimately owned by Lyra Health in the US. And um, I'm responsible for the MENA region. And I came here 14 years ago to set up what is now Lyra MENA. Wow, impressive. Uh, and Inas, if you can tell us a bit about Tekellam. Tekellam is a health tech platform for mental well-being. We offer um, smart wellness uh, tools in addition to screening features uh, and, uh, of course, online counseling for individuals and employees through uh, employee wellness programs. Okay, great. Uh, so you've both uh, have seen the report and you've read it. Uh, I assume you have some ideas about it. Uh, but before we, before we dive deep into that, um, what do you think from your perspective is shaping uh, the well-being in the MENA region? I mean, uh, from our experience, there's a clear direction from the leadership um, on that this is a very important um, subject to look at it and to ensure that the working environments are enabling environments for well-being. Um, throughout also different community projects that we work on. So there is a direction from the leadership um, in the region to look into that. I think also post COVID, there was a more of a, an awareness in the communities about it because, you know, a lot of hidden anxiety and, you know, depression was surfaced up after yeah. COVID. So people are more aware about what does it mean and so on. So there is, um, the topic has been like it's been really on the agenda of national agendas of countries as well as the agendas of the employers and employees and for families and community members i feel like people are more aware about it they started talking about it so um, it's been a great uh, progress now and um, the need is there with the utilization of technology it continues to there will be more and more demand on this um, so it's a matter of the need is there, the problem is there, how we will work together to offer the right solutions for our community members. Uh, and Paul, at Lyra Wellbeing, I imagine you're always working with employee well-being. So maybe you have a little bit of a different perspective on how this impacts the overall well-being of people. Uh, yeah, um, you know, just you know, confirming everything that's just been said there, really, in terms of, you know, well-being now is, 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 is it's on the national agenda. Um, the fact that we're having this conversation about well-being and the research and, and data that we're now seeing coming through from well-being. Our whole, our whole focus is, is business to business. So we're, we're in the corporate well-being arena. Um, so, so yes, I mean, it's COVID. I hate to say that there were some benefits out of COVID, but <laughs> we did benefit in that sense out of COVID. But it, it um, you know, it raised the awareness or the the need to understand more around employees and the impact of, you know, changing the way that we were all working at the time through COVID. Uh, and then post COVID, you know, we've not gone back to how we used to be. We've sort of a hybrid of, you know, working in the sort of office environment, working remotely, combination of the two. Um, and that brings additional challenges and I think employers have been looking at you know what that how that impacts employees 
and you know it's a big part of what we do in terms of you know advising corporate clients in terms of what they need to be doing from a perspective of employee well-being uh, and the impact of not supporting employees you know it's at the end of the day it does affect bottom line so corporates yeah. are now willing to uh, invest, invest. Um, and so I think um, you know times have moved on dramatically from when I came here 14 years ago so. yeah I think like 14 years ago no one knew what well like well-being as a term wasn't even known no yeah no it the, was the we pay a salary for... and they do a job what do you mean well-being what, well what, what, what else do you expect us to do um, and here we are now you know major steps forward in terms of mental health generally and well-being uh, in the corporate field yeah true I think it was only maybe about work-life balance that was kind of taking the spotlight for a while and that was when maybe corporate started thinking about well-being that it's not just okay yes these people come to me from nine to five but but there's also more that we can be doing for them and yeah. there's more that impacts their performance in these hours from nine to five I'm not a lover of the, the term work-life balance because exactly. yeah, balance me assumes too. 50 yeah. 50. Uh, and we you know our personal <laughs> home life and work life and life in general very rarely is it evenly balanced yeah. so yeah more integration yeah. you know uh, they call it the work-life romance now one of our counselors was saying so it's more of a blended approach given you know even how work lifestyle now is uh, is going on where we are reachable all the time so definitely yeah that's exactly my point like a couple of years ago work-life balance was like the objective yeah but now more people are aware, are aware of, of exactly that that it's not a balance it's not like I can shut my shut off my personal life from nine to five, and then my life begins from five onwards. Oh, those, so, so that, those days have gone. gone. Yes, you know, those were my days in my youth. That yeah, was where the you went to work ago. and then you left, and there was no mobile phones. There was no, there was no way that work could contact you. Exactly. Mm -hmm. um, so when you left the office and went home, that was Done. it until you went back in the next day. Um, so those days have gone. Yeah. Okay, so uh, from your perspective, what is impacting well-being uh, generally? What, what, what are the factors that impact our well-being other than work and stress? Technology, I mean, is the main driven, I believe, um, and the main driver for our life and the way we're living now. Um, I mean, at Tekelam, we are very much pro-technology as we are working con constantly into utilize, uh, utilizing technology, AI, and machine learning to help and support in the delivery of mental health services. Yet we really understand that the impact of having technology and how it's been driving, you know, our everyone's days is it comes with a lot of, of uh, stress. It was um, a great example was once uh, uh, mentioned by one of our advisors it's like going back to those old days when once the car was invented, there was no seat belt in the car, right? It took them a while, like car accidents and so on, to create and invent that seat belt. And now it is there, and yet some people are not using it. It's a still, you know, um, a lot, it's a precaution that not everyone on it. And when that's the accident increases. And that's the same example as of the technology is being invented. And the seatbelt that we really need in our life now is practicing mental health and well-being. This is very important. So it, it's, it's now we are in like in the transition phase, you know, that it's coming up. We know that it is there, that it is important to put, to put that seatbelt and practice mental health and well-being um, practices and through our, throughout our day to have a better and happier life. Um, some, they're struggling to put that seatbelt on. Others, they're getting on it. But it's, um, we're living into that transition and technology utilization, again, will keep, you know, um, it's, a, it's, a, it's our lifestyle, you know, everything that we do now is around how technology is, um, is in, you know, part of everything that we do, really. Yeah, it's true. But I mean, personally, I sometimes feel that we're maybe too much technology is, is also causing uh, like this, this, yeah. this, this disruption because even there are all these resorts where it's like, okay, it's electricity free and mobile free. And if you go and you can just spend a couple of days and just enjoy nature, not look at your phone, you don't need electricity. When the sun is down, you go to sleep. So 
there's just all these directions now that maybe too much technology is also negatively affecting exactly, us. Exactly, exactly. And that's why you need the well-being practices to help us to learn how to live with this. It's not something that we can avoid. Like, we can definitely go for that three days retreat or a week or even a month. But it's all about what we come back to as individuals and as working mothers, fathers, you know, each, every one of us. So technology is there. It's not something that we'll have to escape from it or hide from it. But now, how to live with that? And that's what is well-being comes in. And well-being practices are very important. And that's what our community members need. So it's creating that system around uh, our community members again to help them to, to learn how to live with that conflict. Like, I want to be, uh, you know, success is different from every one, of one person to another. Maybe um, as a working mom, I want to enjoy what I'm doing and the mom, what, what I'm working and achieving. Success can be, it's me, you know, achieving great numbers as an entrepreneur and, you know, doing numbers. So it can be this or that. And a lot of, again, that's a conflict that we live through through a daily basis with everything that we do. I come to this podcast, shall I do the podcast or I go pick up my son from the school, right? Or someone else to do it. So this continues. This is our lifestyle. We are reachable. We're in demand. We go for retreats. We come back to this. This is, this is how the way we live. Now, I believe what has been really much needed for us as a community members is to have an easy access to resources to help us to live with this conflict or continuous challenges or goals that we set for ourselves. And we're really proud that this system is being actually created. It's, it's being shaped now. Um, and we're happy to be part of it. We're really happy to be part of this. Yeah, great. Yeah, I, I think, um, I mean, technology's here. It's not going anywhere. It's only ever going to get more and more. More, yeah. yeah. Um, and I think, I, I think what, we, what we have to try and do is um, uh, bring going going the way for the week or the weekend to that wellness spa and everything that you do, bringing that into your everyday activities. So it's you're not waiting for that weekend, you know, because they don't often happen necessarily that often. Yeah, it's how can you bring those those well-being elements that you do on those retreats into your daily activity, yeah. um, so that you can manage your life better. So it's, it, it's all about providing tools to, to help an individual, empower an individual to, to, to live a better, healthy, more well-being focused uh, existence, really. Um, so should, the problem now, we're, 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 if you're looking from, from a, certainly from a workplace perspective, with technology, we're always on call, aren't we? Um, yeah. And you know, it's very much down to reviewing working practices. That's down to employers in terms of, you know, supporting the way that people can work so that it allows them to, you know, want to do the job, but also to, to, to you know, look after their own well-being as well. Um, so it's, it's how we can benefit from all the, the technology that we have available without it, without us having too much of there are some negativities out of all the technology and social media. Um, so how can we make sure that we can make the best of it? Yeah, true. Uh, do you think there is enough awareness about the concept of well-being in the region? I mean, yes, there is progress from the past couple of years from, let's say, pre-COVID to post-COVID. But do you think it's enough? I mean, it's um, it's never enough again, and a lot of really efforts need still to happen. I even for those who they the topic has become you know um, familiar or people started talking about it, but it's talking about it's something making awareness and readiness at the workplace is something, but also taking an action towards that as an individual or as an employer is something else, mm -hmm. and that is taking longer. So um, a great efforts are towards awareness, promoting mental health and well-being at the workplace. We've been really proud of a lot of our clients as B2B as well. We've been really proud of what they are doing and they're trying to promote and also implement wellness uh, programs at the workplace. So it's taking that step further, making sure that those tool, tools are avail uh, available for the employees or the individuals, wherever they go, that action 
not many are actually on it. So we need more in terms of taking an action um, and commitment. And even from us as an individuals, it's like really understanding that this is an important. You don't need to reach the, the challenging time or to be diagnosed with a mental health condition for you to start a well-being journey. Really, for us to deal with this constant decision-making process that we are on it and on this beat of life, we really need to be on a mental well-being journey. Just as I go to the gym to take care of my physical uh, health, I really need to have an access to resources that will strengthen my mental health and my well-being. And that's what I believe, um, you know, uh, Takellam and others, and Lira, and, uh, other solutions are available to help and support us as individuals to have that access. Yeah, sure, we're, we're doing our best. <laughs> so. We do a lot of well-being, but I would still go back yeah. to what's your understanding of well-being? Exactly. And I think if you look in your on your own report, you, you ask the question, what is well-being? Yes. You go to the World Health Organization, you go to the Oxford Dictionary, and you come up with different definitions. There's an underlying theme. You come up with different definitions of, and perceptions of what well-being is. Um, and well-being for the three of us will be different. Exactly, that's true. And so whatever you are doing, you, it really needs to be quite personalized in terms of that well-being guidance that you're giving individuals because yeah. you know what may be good for you may be of no interest to me and vice versa yeah sure so um you were shaking your head no when i asked the question of do you think there's enough awareness of well-being yeah so i probably changed my mind as i was shaking <laughs> i think there's, there's there, there's some. always more we can we, yeah, there's some. always more isn't yeah, that we can learn and understand about well-being you know i i'm learning all the time about well-being it's not it's not that you get to the end point and, and you're there and, and you're fit and healthy. You know, it's, it's, it's that old adage of, you know, it's a journey. There's no end to it. Yeah, um, I think it's a spectrum. It's just a journey that you're on. Yeah, it's more of like a spectrum. So you can't say you've achieved well-being or you don't no. have well-being. It's kind of a, an ongoing pro process. And maybe today I've, I've taken more care of my well-being but next week I'm having a lot of work so I couldn't really focus on that well-being so it's just not that's it. life isn't it yeah yeah yes there's always something going to happen that that can bring challenges and um, so you know well-being if it was on a scale well-being today might be you know one to ten might be nine this afternoon it could be six Sure. You know, yeah, you so wake it, up. You, I don't you're want up and down to think that scale. How, what would that scale be, would be at the end of the day? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, sometimes I wake up and I would rate my well being as like 15 out of 10, and then I go to work and I have a lot of things to get through, and then it's like, okay, it's gradually dropping. But the end well, of the day might be I'm going home yeah. to family and wait, I can't exactly. wait to get home. Yes, home. absolutely. You know, and it's, it's, it's One thing that we've been doing at uh, Tekellam on our solutions, mood tracking, because that is actually a great entry on to help the, um, you know, the professionals to understand and support, you know, our clients and their well-being journey. So mood tracker and mood is a great signal, I believe, for in terms of screening and to help, uh, to help us to reflect um, on our on our days, um, so it's really normal to go on those mood mood swings. I would say, and every day is different, every hour is different. But how to track this and how to reflect on that, and then how to have the time to speak with a professional about this. This is the well-being, um, you know, um, uh, let's say routine that you can establish to take care of yourself. So it's really, and that's what we wanted to do at Tekelem, is to make that really easy and engaging for our users. So you do mood tracking. We have recently introduced face and voice recognition. So to validate, let AI validate how you feel, and then you reflect on this, and then that can be shared, and that can be with, with a counselor, and can be a starting point for a conversation with a professional for everyone to look into this and reflect on how their weeks have been going yeah okay so um you've both seen the reports yeah paul what, what do you think of it what do you think of the findings uh, um i'm always pleased when we have any report. research any data that is regionally specific so yeah. i'm delighted for anything um it, it was interesting in terms of as we were talking you know earlier it, it's you know, it's highlighting high levels of anxiety, depression, um, uh, but at the same time, you know, same similar level of people saying that their their, their well-being is is great and you know, the very best it could be. So a bit of potential 
contradiction there. But yeah. now whether that is, um, I think also in the report, you know, anxiety, depression was primarily self-diagnosed. Yes. So um, it's not necessarily clinical anxiety, depression. Uh, and I think then that's back to maybe a lack of understanding back again, what's your understanding of well-being? You know, what's your understanding of that anxiety and depression? Uh, we all experience anxiety, yeah? Yeah. Um, yeah. Which is great. I mean, yeah. anxiety is... Yeah. We wouldn't take it. Keeps us going. Before the yeah. the episode. <laughs> and we all experience, you know, stress is... There's nothing wrong with stress. Yeah. Yeah. You know, stress is a human yeah. activity that, that we go through everything we do in every day, every part of our life. The, the, Stress becomes a problem when it's it's you know at high levels and the consistent and stress trying. levels, and our inability then to maybe manage that. Um, uh, that's when stress can become a problem. So, uh, you know, it, it's easy. And I think just coming back to what we were saying earlier, if somebody maybe in the report is saying I've suffered from depression, it might be you've experienced mood swings, maybe, yeah. Yeah. Um, but having said that, we know on, from our data, you know, for the last five years, six years, uh, stress, anxiety, depression are the top three reasons why people are engaging with our EAP. Now, yeah. what we do know is those are clinically diagnosed. Yeah. Um, but also in your report, again, and other data has shown that, that um, majority of people with depression don't get diagnosed with depression because they don't realize they've got depression. Um, so it, it's interesting. Yeah, so 65% of respondents actually have responded that they do suffer from, or they think they suffer from depression or anxiety. But they've self-diagnosed. Yes, they have. So they've not gone for professional support. Yeah. Uh, so it's interesting then. So. How was that depression managed if, yeah. if it was exactly. depression? Exactly. We'll they get do? to that, actually. OK. Yeah, what did they do about it? I was like looking, when I was looking through the report, it's like, how many of those are seeking help? No, very little. I mean, I would, I would love to capture that. I mean, in a lot of studies, actually, it's increasing. And that's an index that we keep monitoring. Like, more people are seeking help for themselves or someone that they know, that their condition is, like, maybe diagnosed or screened. But yet, Again, seeking help, where do they go and what do they do, which is something that I believe the report has answered and give like a good insight on that. But there was something else in the report. I don't know whether you're going to get to it, but it was the, um, the view, high percentage of people saying that, that there is less or low stigma now attached to mental yes. health. Yes. Uh, okay. That is also very interesting. <laughs> okay, so you're saying that, like, but, really? then, <laughs> but then people are self diagnosed and they're not going to get support. Why wouldn't you do that? generally because there is stigma still attached to mental health and well-being. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, we do, we we do know, know that there is, like, there's still a lot of work to be done and, and giving people the education they need to seek the help that they need. But stigma is a big part of why people don't do that. And some of them have responded, some of the, um, during the, the survey, some responded that they don't know where to go. Yeah. So, that, so that's also a challenge. And to enhance the experience about where to go, I mean, that's, I believe, like, uh, I'm recalling the moment when Khawl Hamad, founder and uh, CEO of Tekelam, and my friend, she called me, um, and it was like, I, I'm looking for access, and the experience about this and the offering here in the region uh, is difficult. After she was in the U.S. for some time, and that's where she came back home, it's like looking for a solution and an access that is the where the experience is easy and so you don't know where to go and even if you want to go how the experience how the access is easy how affordable it is and how private it is and then how personalized it is so that's how been actually uh, have been what has been driving us is to kill them to do is to try to enhance that experience make it so easy but yes a lot of a lot needs still to be done definitely in promoting this and making sure that everyone knows about is aware of the different outlets and platforms that they can reach or go to but yes i, I think sure. as well sorry if, if if you follow that through i don't know where to go i didn't know where to go but then the next question would would you not ask somebody where you might yeah, yeah. the reason probably why you didn't ask stigma. is the stigma <laughs> yeah you yeah. know if i have a, a, a you know bad knee it's easy i, I feel no no problem at all i said oh i've got a bad knee where, where's best to go to get that sorted yeah 
Um, yeah, that's true. I feel I'm suffering from some mental health challenges. Just as well. You know, it's like, <laughs> but it, 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 it's, 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 it's all about the stigma, isn't it? It's that, you know, if it's really how do we get mental health just to be seen as any other, it's a physical health condition, yeah? Like any other medical condition. So why can't we, why don't we see it like that? Yeah. Yeah. I'd have no qualms in telling you I'm going to see a doctor this afternoon because I've got a bad back. Yeah. But would I tell you I was going to see a psychologist this afternoon because I'm suffering from some mental challenges at the moment? Probably not. Yeah, so when we actually asked uh, the respondents on how they deal with uh, their depression or an anxiety, like 41% said they go for a walk yeah. uh, compared to 5% who said that they would actually talk to a therapist. So it's very, like, there's a drastic difference. They would rather just go for a walk or watch a movie or, you know, just listen to some music. So basically just kind of ignore the problem than address the problem by going to a therapist or a life coach or practice meditation. It might be that, or it might be, you know, if I am, if I am recognizing, you know, the way I am feeling, I'm recognizing the stress I might be feeling under, and going for a walk. It's good. It's then, great. Yeah, you know, if, 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 <laughs> if I come home and feel stressed, um, I'll probably do one of two things. Either go and walk the dog, yeah, uh, talk to the dog as I'm walking, because, you know. Um, My colleague did this. <laughs> what do you say about that? Uh, or, uh, you know, football's my sport, either playing or watching it. Yeah. So it's, it's, like I say, it's all, we're all very different, and it's different ways that we will utilise to, to relieve some of that, that stress that we may be feeling. No, I agree. But in the case of stress, yes. So if I had a stressful day, I do like going for a walk or watching a movie and, and, and that's fine. But my point was, if someone is, is facing, suffering from something more than that, if you're actually depressed uh, if, if, or, yeah, or yeah. actually anxious, but you're, you're still going for a walk, it's like you're putting a Band-Aid on a bullet wound. It's yeah. not. No, and, and, that, that's, and that's where I'm coming back to in terms of... Uh, in, if you believe you've been suffering from anxiety or depression, um, uh, but you've self-diagnosed, it may not be actually, be actually an that. anxiety or depression. Uh, depression may be low mood, yeah. Um, and, and, yeah, but if you're diagnosed with clinical depression, then just simply going for a walk is not going to be How sufficient. Was, one thing that I've learned, and we're also trying to uh, implement, is like, having a mindful uh, walking. So you will do, and because that's what the therapist will even help us and um, uh, help us to learn. Like if, if you are even stressed or you're diagnosed, walking is still is of a good practice, but do we really walk and, you know, ma making it of a mindful, um, more of a practice where we feel the things that we're doing. Again, you were saying to have a self-talk or talk with the dog and so on. So these things that what we learn from a therapist, and again, if we, if you have that kind of a strength and you've you've built those muscles for us, like we, by practicing this kind of um, daily routine of a walk or um, journaling or speaking with the friends, having a good supporting system, all of those, this is are really great. If we build that kind of routine, it will make us be ready more when the stress happens or the times becomes more edgy, and we learn. So we learn how to how how to deal with that. So basically. Walk, speaking to a therapist can be definitely um, a practice. Like again, can be a, the life coach and the counselor that you you touch base with them um, on a regular basis. So you learn how to make that walk more of a beneficial one and effective one that really help you to be more grounded and take you know uh, and give the the right impact from it. No, Talking right. to somebody at yeah. the very least. That's exactly. what, that's what you need to be doing. Yeah. Somebody as a friend or somebody as a professional? Either way. Self talk okay. yeah. is great. We, we, don't, we don't do enough of that. Men are the worst. Yeah. Yes. Um, but we don't do enough of that. Yeah. And, and going back to what we were saying earlier about technology and social media, we're doing even less of it than we used to do. Mm. Yeah. My, fun, my son's 24. He's had mobile phones since he was probably, I don't know, 13, 14. So 10 years, I could probably still count on one hand the number of times he's used it physically as a phone to talk to somebody. Yeah. It's all just chat. Yeah. 
Yeah. So we lose that human interaction, which is a core of our existence, really. Um, so that's the, for me, is the negative of technology and, and social media. It, but it's here, they, so it's how we work with it. So when I say talk, it doesn't necessarily have to be a professional. Um, but just interacting. Yeah. Interact and talk to somebody. Yeah, true. But it's not just mental health. I mean, even, even for physical health, 82% of respondents uh, said that they enjoy good or excellent well-being. But 57% of them said they suffer from physical issues. So even other than the stigma of mental health, I think there's just a bit of a, uh, a, a disparity of, of the standards of what you say when you say I have good mental, uh, good well-being. And then you say, no, but I also have these one, two, three physical issues. So it's back to that very first question on the first page in your yeah. report. What is well being? I think it's like the, the key highlight of the report. Yeah, that people are just not, not aware 100% of when you say I have good or excellent well being, what does that mean or what does that entail? Like, yeah, yeah, and, and, and understanding that well being is, is not just your physical, it's not just your mental. You know, it's your financial, it's your emotional, it's your social, it's your work, occupational, it's the whole thing. You know, everything that, you, that, that you're engaging with and interacting with every day in, in your individual personal life all has an impact. Yeah, um, you know, stress, finance is one of the biggest stresses. Yes, and we did catch that in the report. Yes, a lot of people, a lot yes. of people reported that having uh, financial uh, issues or financial worries and not knowing what's going to happen in the future is the key stressor for them. Well, we know three quarters of people with financial difficulties will experience an impact on their mental health. Of course. Three quarters. Yeah. yeah. So, well, so, so that, that's much, actually aligned. Pretty much, if you're having a financial challenge, you that definitely will be going to be affecting your mental well-being. Yeah, that makes so what are you doing about it? Yeah. Financial counseling is a great element, actually, of a lot of the wellness pro uh, programs that we do, where there's um, uh, good experts that they will guide through that process and kind of a financial education even for, for the little ones. So as they grow, they become more of aware of how to manage those finances with continuous support. So again, just to creating, having access to a resource that will guide you through that for our little ones, how, how much we actually as parents, we're investing in that kind of financial education and giving them that kind of uh, knowledge. So they, as they grow and they have more responsibilities, they know how to manage their finances. Yet financial counseling, that module that we have been offering through um, our wellness program has been very much well, received from people and it's about okay i have so many things that i want to do how to balance that and how to manage it um, and a great uh, expertise can really support make things easier way easier than when what we expect as an individual we think that we have the biggest financial problem that can easily broke be broken down as long as i'm speaking with uh, the right experts yeah i mean uh, actually with the, with the podcast we um we, we do different episodes target just addressing different issues that our members might be facing. And one of the episodes was retirement planning. Mm. And this is actually the most downloaded episode oh. of all the 20 something episodes that we did because everybody seems to be worried about that retirement aspect. So uh, I want to listen to that now. <laughs> sure, I'll send you the link. <laughs> No, it is. Thinking of the future and planning for it. And again, if we are not trapped with the past, that's the challenge. And that's where rule being practices becomes more important to be present. Yet part of us to be present is really need to have a good plan for the way ahead. Yeah. And um, if sometimes we don't know how to do that, it's, it's really simple as much as of reading about it, looking for some online resources, even if I don't want to go and speak with a, with a therapist, like listen to this podcast and many others. And of course, having uh, connecting with the right, with the right um, experts, uh, that's very that's very beneficial. So, and, and I think a big thing for me is is looking after your well-being is not something you know brand new. It's not something we all automatically do it. Mm. Yeah. So if we're feeling low, generally we will do something. Well, we know we're feeling low. We're having low mood. Or not feeling great, we'll, we'll do something about it. Might be going for a walk, might be going out with 
their family somewhere might be going shopping. Not for me, but you know. Um, <laughs> for me. <laughs> but we will do something because we know we want to a feeling big that I'll go and do this. So we are doing things every day that help our well-being. I think maybe more is having a better understanding of, you know, what's impacting on our well-being, recognizing that, being able to see it, and then understanding how I might manage that maybe better than I currently do. It's amazing you mentioned that because my next question is, what do you think are the biggest challenges to well-being? Okay. Well, I don't want to go back Take to that. Your time. <laughs> I don't want to go back because the discussion is again, what is the well-being, and then that when we can measure it. And for a lot of people, it's like um, maybe it's um, the different definitions. The most recent one I was looking at it, it was a values fulfillment. So you feel like you can, you know, live by your values uh, as we each individual and each one of us will constantly uh, have a goal that we want to achieve or reach to it. So as we go and we want to reach that goal, the, um, a lot of conflicts happening. So how do we deal with that is our, how we're taking care of our well-being. So how do we achieve this? How do we really take care of our own well-being? Um, and then that's, that's we, look, we can look into what is the most challenging part. And I believe it's, um, it's again the experience, making it easy, because people, even if they know and they want to take care of their well-being, they don't know how to start, what to do. Yeah. Okay, I want to speak to a therapist, but which, which one? Uh, there is a lot of, like a lot of guidance needs to be, to be done. And that's what, what, again, we go back to having an ecosystem or a system around this where we help and we guide our community members, even pre having a condition, like a kind of a symptom, um, or even if they have a condition or a challenge, that kind of all of that uh, people deserve to have access to tools and have an easy experience that is again is affordable yeah private so i feel it's safe i can go be anonymous wherever it's easy for me um, creating that kind of an experience is is a, is a challenge it's not easy uh, for that to be done um, but we really really happy and proud to be part of this again it is happening but a lot of guidance needs to be done for our community members and that's why you see a lot of national uh, programs as well promoting this like there's one that i'm, uh, I'm um, aware of for the um, university students focusing on that group another for the those who are working in the education sector um, we have a stakeholder that we've been working with them also for about marriage counseling and even pre-marriage counseling what do you look to? Uh, that's financial counseling is part of that as well. So there is a lot of programs happening there. Our community members deserve to have to be guided throughout that and have that easy experience where I feel safe and it's affordable again. And I think from a workplace perspective, I think as we said earlier, um, we're always on call as employees. Um, so I think for me, that's two things. Uh, Employers have to review working practices. Yeah, so there's a lot of talk at the moment about going to a four day week. Yeah, it sounds great. Fantastic. Yes. Fingers crossed. Um, but if you don't change working practices to allow you to benefit from four that, it's pointless. Seven yeah, <laughs> you just end up what can happen is you end up working five days in four, just yeah. longer hours. Yeah. So you've got to change the working practices. You've got to have the flexibility that allows potentially a four day working week to be successful. An actual it could day. actually work against you if you don't change working practices. Mm -hmm. So it, it's, again, it's this holistic approach. You can't just, it's a bit like squeezing a balloon, we'll go four day a week and it pops out somewhere else. So you've got to take that more holistic approach. I think, um, uh, and then in, what I'm saying in terms of, from a workplace, in terms of changing work practices, uh, because we are more accessible, employers have to recognize that and have to have to drive the right culture the white right working practices that support all of that so that everybody benefits um or else you know your manager's contacting you at 10 o'clock at night you feel like you need to respond well 
where's the benefit there? That's that's not that's only going to have a negative. Yeah. Um, and that's got to come from the top down. That's got to be culture driven within an organisation. Yeah, it's, it's great that you mentioned that because 75% of respondents mentioned that they are suffering or they're facing burnout. And many of them mentioned that the key reasons are financial stress and work stress. So what would your advice be to employers to support their employee well-being? Uh, without repeating myself, going back to look at working practices. If I have a lot of my team feeling they are burnt out, then what's causing that? Yeah. yeah, I've got to look at that. Um, you know, when I'm saying changing working practices, it's for the benefit of the organisation. Yeah. It's not just saying, oh, well, I change working practices to make it easier for you to go and work from home and look after your family and the kids. But recognising if I can do that, but do it in a way that allows you still to deliver to the business need, why wouldn't I do it? Yeah. You'll be happier. Healthier, happier, engaged employees, 25% more productive. More loyal employee, actually. And more loyal. And so uh, that's my big gain as an employer. Yeah. Um, so it's not the pizza parties. It's not the uh, the webinars or, or just, you know, I think what you're saying is employers need to do an actual change in the practices. Walk the walk. Yeah. Yeah. There's still a lot of employers talking the talk. Yes. Yeah. Tick box. <laughs> we have got a that. wellness program in. Tick have the done. box. I can move on to the next thing. It'll, it'll, it'll have some benefit, but you're not going to get the real value out of what you may have put in if you just tick box and move on to the next thing. You, you can't do that with well-being. Yeah. Um, if you buy into the concept that there is a financial, significant financial return to you and your organisation then you wouldn't do that. Yeah. So that's... And I feel the same, like, uh, as I've mentioned for the individuals, they need to have a kind of a guidance on what, what they can do. Same for the employers. Um, I mean, a lot of the employers, they want also to do something because they, it's becoming... The, it's not like a luxury subject now. It's like a, a very important thing. They have reported cases of panic attacks and stuff. that It is happening in the workplace. So employers, they want to do something. They still don't know what, what to do, where to go again. So that's, uh, that's uh, I believe, for everyone who's working on mental health and well-being is to establish easy uh, easy guided tools for the employers on what what they can uh, implement in the workplace so when as we deliver um, employee wellness programs we we provide the hr and the team who are over over this a toolkit and the guidance on step by step on what they can do to make this really of an effective program and how to implement it and uh, the various tools things and simple things that can be done to activate such programs that they are being implemented at the workplace so a lot of guidance um, to help the employers also is needed and uh, the more we work with the employers the more we learn as well from them and once you have a good case study you'd like to share it with others so to build that kind of community of people who are working and advocates for mental health and well-being is very important. So we share these kind of stories and we support each others. Where you know what worked uh, as a good case study can be you know done also somewhere else. Yeah. I go sure. back to that first question: What is well-being? What is employee well-being? Yeah. yeah. We have clients come into us and say we want to. Can we have a, a well-being program? Okay. Okay. <laughs> so what? What is it what you're trying want? to achieve? What? what is it you want to achieve? Hmm. What does a well-being program look like to you? you know, what's the organisation's wish for a well-being program? Uh, you know, do you have a plan of what that's going to look like? Because what it is today will should look very different next year and the five years down the line. Yeah. Yeah. And having access to assessments, I believe, for the employers and also the employees helps a lot in identifying the problems. Yeah. So um, making this as well uh, accessible where the employees, they can just do the assessment or as an organization, to have an organizational assessment will help a lot what needs to be done and to answer the, these kind of questions and put a kind of a, you know, a guideline again for the employee wellness programs. But for me to walk the walk, you know, how many times, and I've worked for many organisations, you know, employee engagement surveys. You fill them out, what happens? 
very little exactly often. no so if you're doing anything around well-being okay it's good that you're collating that data but what, what are you doing, doing with about it, it? Yeah. yeah if you're going to collate it and do nothing with it then it's a bit like people generally these days employee engagement service another one yeah i don't i'm not expecting anything coming out of this for me yeah, yeah true so we can't allow that to happen with with well-being data that was seeking to source we've got to do something with it yeah absolutely we're trying we've put the data out there hopefully and actually will act, there will actions be taken to improve the well-being Thank you so much, Inas and Paul, oh, for being you. with us today. I mean, unfortunately, we're out of time, but I, I could have just continued this conversation. Thank so, you for me too. So it's a passion right? for me. Um, uh, once I get going. You. Thanks a lot. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for your time and thank thanks you so for inviting thank me. Thank you, Paul. Thanks. We hope you have some time to check out the report and that you find the insights valuable. Uh, we're available on YouTube, YouTube Music, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and Rami and Amazon Music. As mentioned, the report is available on our website, gigolf.com. So take a look.